Welcome to Star Wars Timeline. My name is Ben, and today I'm reviewing the second book in the Bounty Hunter Wars called Slave Ship. Let's find out if this is a worthy bounty, or if this one belongs in the scrapyard. Stay tuned and find out. Where should I start reading? What is canon versus legends? When does the story begin? The answers to these questions is right here on Star Wars Timeline. Slave Ship is the second book in a popular Star Wars trilogy called The Bounty Hunter Wars. It's written by the same author, Kevin Wade Jetter, and released the same year as the original title, but this one was in October of 1998. Once again, it features awesome artwork by Steven Yule. For those of you guys who watch my channel know that I love talking about Star Wars artists, and Steven Yule is one of the biggest names in the franchise. He was responsible for so many awesome artworks and covers. And check this out, guys. Just like the first book, which I showed you, which I have here with me, he does a tremendous job of just selling us the book and highlighting all the popular characters and so forth. And I really, really enjoyed this one, featuring, of course, Prince Cezor on the cover. Let's take a look in the back a little bit. So in terms of storyline, uh, this trilogy takes place from zero to four years after Battle of Yavin, meaning after Episode 4. So it's basically roughly taking place between episode 4 and 6. Episode 6 being 4 years after the original movie, and this is where this trilogy roughly takes place. Now, before we get into it, quick spoiler alert, guys. First, I will talk about the synopsis, the plot, and the characters of this book. And later on, I will, uh, as I talk about these characters, I will also include my impression of the book. And at the very end, I'll give you my overall thoughts, what I thought of it, how it stacks up against the original title, and whether you should read it or not. If you would like to skip the more major portion of the spoilers and, you know, like plot points and the storylines, you may skip forward to the time-stamped part where I briefly just talk about my overall impression and give this book a final score. Now, let's get into it. You guys have been warned. I have my notes in front of me. There's quite a bit to cover. Um, and one thing worth mentioning right from the beginning, just like the original book, this one continues the same style of narration, meaning the story told here is uh, in two parallel timelines. We have the present, where the cur current events are happening and leading to something which I suspect will finish in the grand finale in the final book. And we also go back through via flashbacks to the prior events to the past and we kind of witness how these bounty hunter wars took place in the present time and in the past so what's going on here in the slave ship first and foremost we are once again with our bounty hunter the Trandoshan called bosk and bosk is uh has he's on a personal vendetta with boba fett the conclusion of the previous book the mandalorian armor it ends with a, with a major tense cliffhanger where uh, Boba Fett, along with his two cohorts, a bounty hunter called uh, Dengar and Nila, uh, some young mysterious woman, they are able to escape Tatooine on slave ship. And as the ship is like leaving the planet's stratosphere, Bosk is right there waiting for them. And he has supposedly planted a bomb into Boba Fett's ship, Slave One, and he detonates it, there's a huge explosion going on, and that's how the first book concluded, and I was left with a major cliffhanger thinking, oh man, what happened? Is Boba Fett dead once again? What's happening here? Uh, but we find out in the beginning of this book that actually Bosk has been outsmarted and outmaneuvered by the legendary bounty hunter Boba Fett, and what happened was the bomb that he planted inside of Slave One was actually a dot, and Fed actually spotted it early on. He knew what was going on, and he kind of twists it on the uh, um, the Trandoshan and outsmarts him. And uh, Boba Fett uses a fake explosion to kind of uh, set off uh, 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 in space, and he uh, fast travels with his ship. So Bosk actually thinks that he won the day, but actually that's not what happens. Uh, Boba Fett is able to outsmart them. He actually takes possession of Bosk's ship and he forces both uh, uh, Bosk and his partner Zuckus into this escape pod and he shoots them off back into uh, space and he leaves another bomb detonating in their uh, uh, escape pod. And as the timer goes, goes off, Bosk is like pa panicking, but they find out it's, it is also a dud. And Boba Fett is actually playing with them and he's saying, I will always will be one step ahead of you. I know how to intimidate you. Don't mess with me. So this was like a pretty interesting opener to this book. And uh, uh, the escape pod 
shoots off and we find out later in the novel that uh, the bounty hunter ends up back on Tatooine. And right here, we are thrown into the characters. I would say that the major distinction be uh, between the two books is that this one focused on establishing the overall premise of what this story is going to shape up like. In here, this book is more character centric. So in order to talk about this book, we got to talk about its characters because honestly, everything here revolves around them. There's not that much action going on in terms of epic factions, you know, fighting one another. It's more has to do with characters and what they're going through. And here we clearly understand Bosk's uh, uh, motivations quite a bit. Uh, I would say that in the first book, he's probably the most fleshed out character, even though he's not particularly too smart and he doesn't always win with uh, the day, but we know what angle he's coming from. He fa hates Boba Fett in the second book because Boba Fett was hired and responsible for destroying the Bounty Hunters Guild. And it affects uh, Bosk in many ways. Primarily, it wounds his hunter's pride, right? Bosk is part of this uh, species, the Trandoshans, and they're a hunter species. We see that both in Legends and also in Canon. We see a little bit of them in Star Wars, Clone Wars, I believe. Was it Clone Wars or Rebels? Anyway, we see them in one of these shows. It's been quite a while since I see them. And you understand that these are hunters, right? They're, they're vicious species, and they pride themselves on their skills as hunters. And when that is taken away from uh, Bosk, he feels very intimidated. He's like, he's not going to stop there. He's good. He wants Fed's blood. And another thing that affects him in a great way is that now his bounty hunter reputation is completely uh, undermined. Nobody fears Bosk anymore. He doesn't have that reputation that he outsmarted or killed, you know, Boba Fett. Because we learned in the first book that Bosk had this ambition to actually uh, position his father out and keep murder his father and become the next leader of the bounty hunters guild and rule with an iron fist. That was his idea. Of course, it didn't go that way, but it was really nice to see how his arc develops in the second book. Now we move away from Bounty Hunters to another very, very intriguing character who is further fleshed out in the second slave ship book, and that is Kuat of Kuat. So there's a lot of industrial politics and intrigue going on in this particular book, and I would say it's also one of the major themes which seems like in this trilogy. So it's not about just bounty hunters themselves, but other plots and uh, twists that are going around, uh, uh, around them in the uh, larger galaxy. So that's pretty, pretty cool. And what happens here is that this Quad of Quad, he's from a dynasty of Quad family who oversees these legendary shipyards who supply ship to the Empire. And they're basically one of the most influential and powerful corporations um, in the galaxy. So this guy has quite a lot of influence and he's a fiercely independent individual. He wants to protect the legacy of his family from the empire, from this other player, Prince Scizor, this criminal syndicate, crime lord, and also from other ruling houses of Quad Planet who kind of wants to take possession of the shipyards and of course rule all that capital and have all that money and uh, stuff like that. And uh, we find out in this book that there's ruling families have uh, inner bickering in politics and backstabbing going about, and they want to dislodge Quad and his family, who has been given uh, rights as a dynasty to pass on the uh, privileges from father to son to oversee the shipyards, because apparently this family has been very effective and the planet has been pleased with their work so far but now the ruling houses are kind of like oh we want a piece of the action as well um and uh uh there's this, this other uh player that comes uh in this book from the quad planet called cause of uh Neeland house and what he does is basically he murders his the elder from his own clan and he devises this very elaborate uh healing tank where supposedly this elder is held on the lifeline and he postures with this tank and he brings the leader to this meeting of the ruling houses and he said well see our leader is still alive and he still has major words to say about who's going to rule the shipyards next but it was actually a ploy and we find out as a revelation in this novel that that person has been long dead and this new guy this younger uh, uh very power hungry cause is actually using a corpse to try to 
uh, uh, take possession of the shipyards and, and you know, outmaneuver Kuwait of Kuwait. And, of course, uh, 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 the main leader of, of, of the shipyards, he, he is smarter, he's older, he's much wiser, and he's able to reveal this conspiracy and say, like, no, this is not how it's going to go. You are the liar here. And my family has been responsible for the shipyards. We've done a very effective job, and we kept the planet independent despite Emperor Palpatine and you know, Prince Caesar pushing over us and trying to dictate the rules to us. We are one of the few free planets in the galaxy and free mega corporations and we're having so much capital and you're not going to be the one to taking it away because i know better so that was pretty interesting character development there a lot of stuff happening on this planet i found it interesting i've always gravitated towards characters and story first and action is always a secondary thing to me so from my perspective i enjoyed that aspect of the book a lot next we move to prince scissor for those of you guys who read the Shadows of the Empire uh, novel, also a Legends book, we know that this guy is like one of the most interesting villains in Star Wars, right? He's from this race of the uh, uh, lizards called the Fallen, and he has these pheromones that he's able to affect the opposite sex. But he's also a very cunning, highly, supremely intelligent man with a, power, a, a criminal syndicate that has power all across the galaxy. And they're able to operate under the Emperor's nose. And even Vader is not the wiser. So he actually commands a lot of resources, a lot of power. And what Scizor is after, he is in contest with Darth Vader to be the Emperor's closest right-hand man, to be his enforcer. And he always tries to outsmart and embarrass Vader and vice versa and say that, you know, you're not smart enough, you're not capable enough, I should be by the Emperor's side. And Vader, of course, in their next meeting in this book, where Prince Caesar stands before the Emperor trying to make amends and excuses that his plan is not completely executed, it's not going the way that he wants to, and, you know, the Emperor's expectations are not being fulfilled, and Vader is there to actually make a mockery of the whole situation and laugh at Prince Caesar and actually choke hold him at one point, which embarrasses this very, very powerful, very ambitious individual, and there's a lot of tension in those scenes. And you feel like, oh man, what's going to happen between Vader and Prince Azor? That really at each other's throats. And the Emperor is there like only to fuel the fire. He doesn't care who stands by his side as long as that person is effective in uh, um, executing his plans. So Prince Azor, being a smart guy that he is, he convinces the Emperor that, look, like, no, 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 my plans are still good. We will still be able to accomplish what we need. And what they wanted to do is basically to make all the bounty hunters fight each other. First of all, obviously, in the first book, they planned to destroy the bounty hunter guild. So they're not united. They don't have a common cause anymore. And they have to fight amongst each other. That story continues in the second book. And Prince Caesar is basically saying, let's call away the weaker bounty hunters. And only the strongest ones will survive. And know those, those are the guys we will employ for these special tasks for the Empire that you casual soldiers are not able to pull off because they're too regimented, they're true, uh, 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 true to their orders, and they can't think outside the box. But bounty hunters can. And uh, what they do is, between the Emperor and Prince Azor, they devise this very, very intricate and uh, plan. They take this former stormtrooper, elite stormtrooper, who trains others, and he's like highly professional, called uh, Atreon Vassand. And they use him as a bait. They make him murder his entire company of stormtroopers and supposedly go rogue and desert the Empire. And they basically uh, post a bounty on his head and saying they want him alive, brought back to the Emperor, and they offer a ludicrous sum of money for him, obviously playing on the uh, bounty hunter's greed, uh, counting on the fact that all of the hunt hunters will go after him and kill each other in the process, and only the strongest one will survive. Um, let me see. Let me gather my thoughts here. Ah, and, and also, what we learn is that uh, there's layer within layer in Prince Azor's plans that his true ambition is not only to serve the Emperor, but what he ultimately wants to do is destroy both the Emperor and Vader and become the next 
master of the galaxy. He he believes that his Black Sun organization is ripe in, in its control and power schemes, and it can be a lot more effective than the Empire. And all that he needs to do is bide his time, play you know a pawn in the Emperor's game and bow his head, and even play into Vader's ego. But later on, he plans to basically subvert both of them and destroy them and become the leader. Um, and we learn by the end of this book that there is this other party uh, called the... Uh, uh, let me find out what's his name. There's this uh, assembler in the first book, this uh, arachnid-like creature called Kudar Mubad. And he's basically an information broker, and he deals with the emperor, he deals with Prince Azor, and he sells the information to the higher bidder. And we saw, obviously, all the major characters kind of like play around Kudar Mubad and use his services. And here, this thread continues, but now uh, Prince Azor has something interesting happening. Because in this very intricate literal web slash brain of this arachnid, which just floats openly in space... Um, this character has these small little nods that he creates who go around and fulfill his like menial tasks. And one of them is called uh, um, a node called balance sheet. And he's not supposed to be autonomous. All that they do is they fulfill all the functions of this Kudar robot uh, a character, uh, like uh, literally balancing the sheets or keeping lists of all the important meetings that he has to go to or whatever. You get the idea. But this one node called balance sheet, he goes rogue and he starts acting independently from his master. And that's supposedly how this species procreate when the youngest one becomes independent and he starts become as smarter and as conniving as his father or master. And then he actually kills them and takes over the possession of this floating ship web thing and becomes the next one. And Prince Caesar plays into that. He says, okay, maybe I can use this little character who approached me and I have another plan in play. Obviously, that's going to be revealed in the third book, which I'm reading right now. I, I didn't get to that part yet. But it's interesting where Prince Caesar is going to go with his ultimate plans and whether they're going to succeed or not. And the last thing I want to say about the plot here is that I mentioned early in the review that uh, it takes place in parallel timelines. We have the past flashbacks and we have the present time. And all of that is delivered via conversations between Boba Fett, this young woman called Neela, and this other bounty hunter, Dengar. And it's their interaction on this ship, right? They, they steal Bosk's ship and to hide their identity and play into the fact that supposedly Boba Fett is dead and the news spreads across the galaxy. It actually works in Boba Fett's favor because now he can operate freely without the fear of reprisal. He can actually accomplish his tasks sooner. And... Basically, all these three characters interact with one another on the ship. And as they do, their storylines, their characters evolve more. And this is one reason where I like this book a bit more than the first one. I said that this one was pretty competently written, but it felt like it's just a stanger ground. It's like putting all the chess pieces on the board, whereas this book now finally goes into discussing those characters. And I have to say that each one of them has motivations which are clear, they're distinct, and make the characters more interesting and engaging, for the exception of Boba Fett. So Boba Fett is this guy who, yes, we understand his motivation. He is ruled by profit and greed. We don't understand to which goal, what's his final destination, what he's trying to accomplish in this book, because along this book, they're traveling to this unknown destination. And this young woman, Nila is somehow pivotal to his plans, but we don't know what those are yet. All we know is that nobody can defeat him. He's basically the Batman of Star Wars. He can outsmart everybody. He can outgun everybody. He can sit with his bag uh, to, to another bounty hunter pointing a gun in his face, and he will just sit there like, no, 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 you, you don't compare to me. I could kill you at any moment, and I can see through your psyche. I can read your mind. I know what your next move is going to be. And I find it a little bit boring. I don't like characters who are like Superman figures, who are infallible, you know, they're un un invulnerable. Their armor is like so thick, nobody, nothing can hurt them. I don't know. It's, I find that a little bit boring. It's, it's kind of cool in the beginning when you're maybe when you're like a teenager and you're 
first encountered this type of character. Oh, you know, Boba Fett, he's such a badass. Or Din Djarin, he's such a badass. Nobody can touch him. But then something must happen that disrupts that flow a little bit and shows that, that there are other characters out there in the galaxy who could kick ass and he could pose some kind of threat to Boba Fett. It ain't happening in this book. He's still the Batman of Star Wars. And for those of you guys who read a lot of DC books, you know that Batman always has a plan to the plan to the ultimate plan. Even when somebody captures him and his body is brutalized, he's inside of his mind. He's able to adjust his psyche to fight the villain and always come up with an answer, always come up with a plan that will win the day. I personally find that a little bit boring. Then we move to Neela. And Neela realizes that she's somebody important. We discussed that in the first book, she's a woman with, with an amnesia. All that we know about her is that she, her earliest memories go back to Jabba the Hutt's palace and that she's a dancer girl there and that her name is Neela. And oh, uh, from that point forward, she's very frustrated. She doesn't know what her past is. And she's trying to find that out because she feels like she doesn't have an anchor. She doesn't know where she belongs. Kind of like Rey. If you think actually about Star Wars sequels, she's sort of like a Rey character. She knows that she's capable of something. Obviously, she's not force sensitive, but there's something more to her than her name. And uh, in this book, she basically tries to push both Boba Fett and Press Dengar, uh, at one point even uh, uh, pointing a gun at Dengar and Boba Fett, trying to figure out who she is. It's like, tell me, guys, you, you seem to know something about my past. And, you know, obviously, Dengar is only able to give her the information, all the drama that transpires around the beginning of the Return of the Jedi, when Jabba's palace is being attacked, and when all the bounty hunters scatter, and when, obviously, Boba Fett is presumed death. That is, that's as much as Dengar seems to know about Nilan. Uh, but what Fett does is he appreciates Nilan's very analytical mind, that despite being frustrated, she also knows how to demonstrate demonstrate cunning and patience and uh, she is bound on discovering her true identity and that seems to be drive her driving her really really uh, uh, hard forward and boba recognizes those traits that he also has himself and he says okay maybe you can be shaped up into something more adequate i don't know if he's going to train her as a bounty hunter that remains to be seen but boba fett sees some sort of potential in her and i really enjoyed that a lot um, i think that the author was able to build the intrigue around her and give us a little bit of information bit by bit you know we're not stuck in one place with her we're slowly carving away at this character and we're learning her background a little bit more and more and last but not least dengar's motivations are also being reinforced first of all we know that in this book he is here along for the ride he clearly doesn't uh uh, uh think that he's smarter or more uh, 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 powerful than Boba Fett that he will be able at any point to outmaneuver Boba Fett. He knows what he is worth. And he's like, okay, I'm just here along for the ride. I'm not going to try to challenge Boba Fett at any point on this mission. And I realize that I'm only important to Boba Fett as far as executing his mission. And I hope I just, I will get away with my life. Because what Dangar wants to ultimately accomplish is actually to leave the Bounty Hunter uh, uh, game. He wants to leave. He was get enough money to set him off and establish some sort of lifestyle with this woman that he com uh, constantly brings back called Manoro. And Manoro is some kind of uh, alien woman that he's in love with. And uh, he regrets that he can't be with her because of his occupation is a hazard to her. So it seems like he sent her to a different part of the galaxy and he's trying to throw together some kind of, you know, uh, funds for them for them so he can leave the bounty hunters forever and be with her i found it quite admirable and quite likable he's not a very noble kind of person he's a, a scum of the galaxy like the rest of the bounty hunters but he has very human traits that he loves somebody he's willing to do a lot for them and it, it looks like he's putting his life on the line he's willing to sacrifice it all partnering with boba fett just to accomplish his uh, task so that was pretty interesting and I really enjoyed all the interactions between the three in the book. So I would say in general, here's my overall thoughts and opinions of this book. I personally liked it more. I think it's a stronger entry than the Mandalorian armor, where the first book just basically it sets up the conflict. And I know I was being a little bit impatient judging the book on its own, saying that mm, it feels incomplete. But guys, 
I will come back to it because I understand it's a whole you know trilogy of book. There is three books to cover to get the full story because it seems like the author was pumping these books out really, really fast. This one came out earlier in 1998. This book came out the same year, which is quite uncommon to write you know, multiple books per year. It takes a little bit of effort, and it looks like he really was thinking it as a one complete story. So the first book functioned as a setup. Second book is something that I personally look for in stories. Character, motivation, you know, tension, intrigue. And this book has it all. And I really, really enjoyed from the narrative standpoint of how the author is able to write prose and structure a story. I would say that both books are equally solid. I prefer to favor one over the other, but that's my personal bias. I think in general, the author is very talented. He knows how to write a character. He knows how to write a setup. He knows how to create tension, right? For you to keep reading and trying to figure out, hey, what's going to happen next? I'm invested in this story. And I would say that the second book is also more of a thriller than the first one, because the first book has m plenty more action. Obviously, because it talks a lot about the scenes in The Return of the Jedi when the Jabba's palace is being attacked. Second book, I would say, has only one major action scene. It's actually quite interesting. I found all the elements that the author put in there uh, make up for an, uh, a different type of action scene that we generally see in Star Wars. And I actually enjoyed it because it was like an industrial machine involving the, uh, the action. There was like a, a group of villagers and so forth. So I really enjoyed that. I liked it. But primarily, the book moves forward, build, building intrigue and building the story and kind of giving us this look into the final destination where it's all going to end up in the final book. Again, I liked it. I thought it was worth my time. I really enjoyed going on this journey. And now I just started book three. I'm in like a third chapter, and I'm curious to find out how all of it is going to resolve. Um, I actually enjoy politics in Star Wars when it's done correctly. I'm one of the fans who generally criticizes the prequels with their, everybody says the word politics. I just felt that the, the way they were presented was very rudimentary or not to be offensive, but I, I thought they were quite childish and, and, and very on the nose, kind of like political jargon and talk. It just didn't feel like the, the movies were speaking to adults. You know, George Lucas insists that the movies were made for kids with all the trade federations and all the senatorial uh, 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 intrigue going on. I, I don't know to which extent it was true, but anyway, those are the movies. But here in this book, there's a lot of industrial espionage going on. All these ruling houses of uh, Quad Planet are trying to vie for power and, and possess this you know money-generating corporation. That was kind of cool. I liked that a lot. And I enjoyed the power play and conflict between the Prince Azor and Vader and also Palpatine. And Caesar thinking that he could outsmart both the Emperor and Vader. I'm like, okay. He seems to be like a, a, a capable guy. His Black Sun organization is all over the galaxy. Is he going to be the one? Obviously, you know, I've read tons of books since then. I know what the, what the plot is. But for the sake of this story, in isolation, it builds for an intriguing character thinking to ourselves like, whoa, this dude has the chops. He's like, is he going to like maybe disrupt the Emperor's flow and like take a, a greater chunk of the galaxy for himself and still we, we will still have the Emperor and the uh, Darth Vader that we see in the movies. How is that going to turn out? Pretty cool. So I liked it a lot. Um, and last but not least, I really enjoyed the characters in the story. I enjoyed their motivations. I enjoyed how they were all fleshed out. And I really liked the new faces like Trian Vassant, this uh, Imperial a uh, uh, stormtrooper who is like a high class guy and it seems like when Boba Fett and the rest of them encounter him he actually gives Boba Fett a tiny bit of a challenge which kind of you know I, I have to say that uh, I'm contradicting myself a little bit he does provide a little of a challenge to Boba Fett I was like okay so he's not just this pushover uh, stormtrooper that we see in the movies that can't hit anything he's actually a somebody because he trains other bouncing hunters and he has this the reputations of a vicious, vicious man not to be trifled with. I'm like, okay, he's cool. And I really enjoyed this young woman called Kadir of Halvolt, who is a member of this other ruling house, who decides to side with Kuat of Kuat, and she believes that he is the rightful owner of the Kuat shipyards for a reason. 
that he is a very effective man. And she basically throws her clan's lot with his and says, no, 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 I'm going to help you. And the reason that she wants to help is that she has a connection with this young woman called Nilan. It seems to be this Nila character is somehow involved with the Kuat plan and, and with one of its ruling houses. Again, it's all building on this intrigue, and I really, really enjoyed it. I want to see how this is going to turn out in the end in book uh, three and how these characters are going to connect to one another. So my closing thoughts are, I think um, this book and this trilogy in general is probably not for everyone. It is slower paced than other Star Wars titles that I read. It greatly depends for your love for these characters. And if you enjoy them, if you enjoy bounty hunters for who they are and not necessarily the crazy action that they're capable of, then this probably is for you. Um, also, I found oddly that the book titles don't quite match the tone of each book or the story that is in them. For example, this one is called Mandalorian Armor. Obviously, we see Boba Fett on the cover. and But we find out through the books that Boba Fett's past his prior history isn't explored. You have to understand that this was released before Star Wars prequels, and there's no mention whether Boba Fett is or isn't a Mandalorian, right? We don't know whether he's a clone. There is no mention of his father. We don't know who he is. And it seems like this Mandalorian armor, the way it is revered in the Mandalorian show and the further Mandalorian lore, which was very much developed in the Legends era of Star Wars, by Karen Travis and other authors who basically came up with this race of Mandalorian creed who all don this armor and follow a special creed and they don't necessarily have to be one race of one species. They are anybody who follows the creed could be Mandalorian. But here in this book, Boba Fett doesn't even revere Mandalorian armor. It doesn't matter to him. He has like a whole stockpile of them in the, both of these books. And whenever his helmet is damaged, whenever his chest plate is like a... Uh, 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 Axe burned by this uh, 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 creature that he is in the uh, um, Sarlacc pit. So he like he is willing to discard one piece, repair it quickly, and get another one. So why is it called Mandalorian armor? I don't get it. It has nothing to do with Boba Fett's reverence for the Creed or for that kind of Mandalorian past in any sort of way. So that was kind of strange. And same is true for the slave ship. Uh, you have this new ship uh, of Bosk that uh, um, uh, uh, Boba Fett steals, and he has these other two unwilling partners right there have to tag along with him because the woman is needed for Boba Fett's plans, and Dengar is there because he's capable and because also Boba Fett need, needs to exploit him one way to another. So yeah, it's true that he, Boba Fett kind of like commands them in a way, but why the slave ship? There's nothing in regards to slavery being discussed here. Once again, this is prior to prequels. Tatooine is not a slave planet in this series of books. And Boba Fett is not a slave owner. He just have has like two unwilling followers, so to speak. Why is it called a slave ship? I don't get it. I mean, it's not a major drawback for me. I'm just like, I found it an odd fact to point out. Like for me, the book titles don't necessarily... Just call it the Bounty Hunter Wars. And it makes all the sense in the world. And leave it there. Book one, book two, book three. That would have made all the sense in the world for, for me. And just you don't go beyond that. Um, the last thing that I want to say is that... Uh, um, give this book my final score. And I understand that there is a lot of group of uh, 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 Legends readers who thought this book, uh, book trilogy was really, really poor and boring, and it didn't tap into the advertised material, right? We see a lot of Boba Fett. Presumably, there's a lot of bounty hunter uh, action going on. There is some, but it's mostly about the intrigue and power play. So I know there is a group of people who don't like it, and I know that there is a group of readers who absolutely love this series. They call it the best thing ever. And it seems to me that those people kind of were drawn to the same things that I was. So if I were to give this book a final score... I would give it a 3.5 out of 4. It's not my absolute favorite, highest recommendation, most mind-blowing Star Wars Legends book, but it's very competently written, and it executes best its characters. Exactly what I like in my Star Wars books, in my Star Wars shows, in comics, in video games. 
I like characters. I like to gravitate towards someone and say, okay, I want to follow their story. And then all the action and all the drama makes all the sense in the world to me. And this is where the book succeeds greatly. I would give it 3.5. Um, I honestly left this trilogy uh, on the shelf for many, many years. I actually purchased it when it first came out in like uh, late 90s. And it's set there on the shelf because I'm not honestly a huge fan bounty hunters fan it's one topic of star wars i'm like okay i'll maybe i'll read it later same with uh, uh spaceships i left the x-wing series for a long long period of time having him sitting on the shelf because it's one area that i wanted to touch uh, later and leave for the past before i moved on to star wars canon but i now started reading the uh x-wing series and i'm completely blown away you know by those books this here is an interesting read it's not something that i'm necessarily go out of my way to to read it on the on the bounty hunters but i enjoyed what's here in this book and that's why the 3.5 score anyway guys i hope you enjoyed uh, uh uh my review and i would love to hear in the comments what you think of this trilogy if you completed the whole thing please don't spoil the third book for me but let me know how you felt about it did you feel like it was lacking in action did you feel that the author represented the title of the books correctly that the bounty hunter wars promise that was given to us is actually delivered in this trilogy or did you feel a little bit betrayed and say like well that's the books are not what was advertised and the story is quite different so i was disappointed i would like to hear about it all from you guys as always thank you so much for watching if you enjoyed this review please consider subscribing all of your support really means a lot to me and i'll see you guys next time take care